Um, my name is Susanna Lachelt, also known as Susan Lachelt, and I'm a PhD candidate at the UCL Interaction Center in London. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about our work on designing inclusive computing curricula for special education needs students in their classrooms. So before I go into that, I just want to acknowledge uh, the wonderful people who are part of this work, including my brilliant supervisors from UCLIC, um, Yvonne Rogers and Nikolai Marquardt, um, and from the University of Sussex, uh, Nicola Yule, Lina Nagel, and Grazia Ragone. Uh, and this work was jointly funded by the BBC and the EPSRC. So, off the bat, I'd like you to imagine a typical mainstream secondary classroom. How are the learners, how are the students learning? How are they interacting with each other and the material? Now, imagine a similar classroom, but this time a secondary special education needs classroom. Again, how are the students learning? How are they interacting with each other and the material? What do you visualize as being the core differences between special education needs classrooms and mainstream classrooms? So it's not always apparent at first sight, but special education needs classrooms have a variety of distinct challenges. At the core, they're often very mixed, so it's very rare to find a special education needs classroom where all students have one type of a learning difficulty, like a specific speech and language learning difficulty. Instead, uh, in a special education needs classroom, Students have a vast range of primary diagnoses, and you can find students with a spectrum of distinct learning strengths and learning challenges, which is wider than that of typical mainstream classrooms. But at the same time, it's been suggested in the literature that special education needs classrooms come with a set of key challenges that are applicable to a wide variety of uh, special education needs learners, and these really include difficulty with understanding and recalling abstract concepts, difficulty with sustaining attention to the task at hand for an extended period of time, and difficulty with collaboration. The last one is primarily associated with uh, the autism spectrum, but is also related to a variety of other special education needs. So in this research, we really wanted to investigate how to make learning computing, uh, along with all its benefits, more inclusive by supporting the challenges of special education needs learners in their classroom. Um, and by inclusive computing, we mean designing methods for teaching computing that take into account the abilities and challenges um, of all learners to enable everyone to succeed. So to do this, we use the Magic Cubes toolkit um, which is uh, an Arduino-based physical toolkit for learning about sensors, actuators, and wireless connectivity in kind of different and engaging ways. Um, so the Arduino-based toolkit has been designed at the UCL Interaction Center, and it takes the form of this physical hand-sized cube. Um, and it gives rise to not just learning about electronic components, but other computational thinking uh, principles like algorithmic thinking and debugging through a variety of learning tasks like making, discovery, and programming. So the reason we chose to use a physical interface to explore inclusive computing uh, was because of the, because the range of benefits physical and tangible interfaces have been proposed to have seem to have, uh, seem to map strongly to kind of the challenges of special education needs classrooms that I just discussed. So uh, for example, they can provide concrete representations of abstract concepts uh, which can lower the entry threshold to learning about complex computing concepts. They can also invite embodied and engaging learning, which can be feasibly hypothesized to help learners sustain attention. Um, and they also can have a long history of uh, supporting collaboration, kind of stemming from um, Suzuki and Kato's seminal work in the 90s. So, our core question here was how can we tap into these purported benefits of physical and tangible interfaces in real special education needs settings to make learning computing more inclusive? And moreover, how does the actual design of the interface, the physical form factor um, of the physical computing toolkit, as well as the learning task contribute to three core facets of learning, which are collaboration, comprehension, and engagement? So beyond their highly physical form factor, we chose the Magic Cubes as the toolkit to explore, as they can be used with a variety of learning tasks that call on various embodied actions and types of collaborative activity. So uh, the cubes can be assembled um, from a print, flat printed circuit board sheet through making. So I'll just show you here. I don't know if you can see in the back, but um, anyway, the activity is aimed at kind of conveying the what core 
uh, components of a computer are. So each side represents a different core component. For example, input, output, the microcontroller, and power. Um, and uh, this activity really teaches how these components can be put together to create a working computational device. The cubes can also be pre-programmed with a variety of um, discovery-based tasks that are aimed at uh, providing kind of an entry point to learning about how sensors, actuators, and other electronic components work. Um, so for example, in the little video you see, um, you can see children trying to discover how a nightlight functions. So um, when the light sensor senses it's bright out, the um, embedded NeoPixel lights inside the cube is off. Uh, but as soon as the light sensor is covered, the light inside turns on. So as you can see, these sorts of discovery-based tasks can really lead to learning through the body um, and performative actions like reaching and jumping that you see here, uh, depending on how they're designed. So the cubes can also be programmed by learners using ArduBlock, which is a visual block-based language for Arduino. Um, and this can really extend the set of concepts that are taught with the cubes even further. So uh, from learning just how electronic components function to learning how to make them function by programming and uh, creating algorithms. So we've used these cubes um, in, a, in a variety of contexts, uh, kind of ranging from kids as young as seven to big kids uh, with no upper age limit to speak of. Um, but here we studied them in a different context, which was a secondary school classroom with special education needs students um, in England. And we took over their weekly elective computing session for a period of six weeks. So in the classroom, there were 11 students who were 16 to 19 years old, um, nine male, two female. And they had a range of different primary diagnoses. So uh, five of the students were on the autism spectrum. Um, where they were on that spectrum varied from individual to individual. Three had primary diagnoses uh, that included learning difficulties, two of whom had general moderate learning difficulties and one of whom had uh, specific learning difficulties related to speech and language. And the three students had other primary diagnoses which included acquired brain injury, uh, social, emotional, and mental health difficulties, and one student had no, no specific primary diagnosis. So in addition to um, the participant, uh, we had one teacher in the classroom, two key workers, and three to four researchers. Um, and we carried out, as I mentioned, six sessions over a period of six weeks. Uh, each session was 90 minutes long, and on subsequent weeks we alternated between sessions based on the magic cubes and consolidation sessions. So here I'll mainly focus on the sessions uh, based on the magic cubes, but you can read a bit more about the consolidation sessions in the paper. The consolidation sessions were main were aimed at uh, getting the students to reflect and transfer their knowledge, the knowledge they had learned with the cubes to a different context. So in week one, uh, the students completed making and discovery-based tasks. In week three, they started learning how to code in ArduBlock, the visual block-based language for Arduino. Uh, so they created their own algorithms and learned about if-else statements and so on. Um, in week five, the activity was more open-ended where the students uh, were asked to design and code their own animations. So um, the strategies that were important for us when designing the tasks were based on universal uh, design for learning guidelines and other special education needs literature and included providing a lot of opportunities for uh, observation and collaboration. So for example, by asking the students to work in pairs throughout uh, the sessions, and designing the activities to be very physical and visible. Uh, we also ensured that the, short, the tasks were short and attainable and that they built each other conceptually so that um, each subsequent task was more complex than the prior. Um, we provided instructions in multiple representations, uh, so visual, um, written, and verbal. And we also provided lots of opportunities for consolidation as I previously men mentioned. So we collected a lot of qualitative data. Uh, kind of the core part of our data was uh, video recordings uh, taken with the students and their parents' consent uh, through all the sessions. We also collected the artifacts the students created and made observations about them, like the animations they made um, and the designs they came up with and design challenges. And uh, we collected interview, peer interviews between the students. So they interviewed each other to kind of reflect on what they had learned. Um, and um, yeah, so 
So in terms of the analysis, we analyzed our data qualitatively using interaction analysis guidelines. And uh, the focus was on the social and techno material context of interaction. So we really wanted to see how the interaction unfolded uh, between the students, between the students and the cubes, as well as uh, between the students and the different learning materials um, and the physical space itself as well. So for each of the three broad categories that I mentioned, uh, comprehension, collaboration, and engagement, we collected a number of themes through the interaction analysis. And next, I'll go through some of these individually. So um, in terms of collaboration, we found four main themes. We found that collaboration was very fluid in discovery and making tasks, which I'll expand on momentarily. But it was actually more, a bit more static in programming tasks. We also found that the students uh, supported each other throughout the sessions uh, and supported kind of each other's strengths and difficulties together. And they were also very keen to share the, their successes while learning with the Magic Cubes. Um, so I'll expand a bit on the fluid collaboration and collaboration programming next. So in the making and discovery-based tasks in week one, there were no desktop or laptop computers present. Uh, so instead, the students were sat in two large circular tables uh, and interacted with only the cubes around the table. Uh, here, the collaboration was very fluid. And by that, I mean there was a lot of mimicking and watching um, that took place, not just within pairs, but also between pairs and around the whole table as well. And this was really enabled by the fact that uh, individual interaction with the cubes was visible to everyone uh, in the shared space, as well as with the fact that students drew attention to themselves when they discovered new things um, by making exclamations or repetitively showing off what they had discovered. So I'll give one example of a student named Curtis who that, uh, I'll tell, call him Curtis, who discovered a specific discovery-based task before all the others around the table, uh, which required blowing into the temperature sensor to produce a larger fire animation, um, which looked a bit like this. Anyone can see? Um, and when he did this, he uh, quickly exclaimed to everyone around him, hey, look, I made a fire, which was met with lots of oohs and ahs around the table. Um, and everyone repeating the action on their own cubes as well. So this watching and mimicking really allowed uh, everyone around the table to come to the same level of understanding as Curtis. Um, and the teacher later commented how surprised he was about Curtis doing this kind of show-offy show collaborative behavior, which uh, was really atypical of him. So in contrast, um, during the programming-based tasks, collaboration was far less fluid. Um, and kind of more static. So specifically, uh, within pairs, the students uh, were seen to work together, but really, uh, instead, they divided themselves into having static roles. So in nearly all of the pairs, one student took charge of the keyboard, and one took charge of the instructions, um, and they worked together in that way. So also, in contrast to the making and discovery-based tasks, without a computer, there was nearly no unprompted collaboration between pairs. And this was likely due to the fact that it was very, uh, that, that it was more difficult to observe and share the code as just the digital, the, the physical artifact itself in the making and discovery-based tasks. Um, however, I'll mention that when, when we prompted the students to collaborate between pairs, they were really great at helping each other um, and even walked through uh, their step-by-step -step trial and error processes with others. Um, for example, to convey complex concepts like how delays work in animations. Um, in terms of comprehension, we found three themes. Uh, one of these was uh, how the importance of the roles of the instructors and the instructions. Um, one was about how verbal reflection that was engendered by the collaboration and the very physical nature of the cubes uh, helped students come to comprehension. And the other was building understanding through embodied reflection, which I'll expand a bit on now. Um, so embodied actions were prevalent through all the task types, making, discovery, and programming. Um, and these really help the students understand abstract concepts. So for example, one boy was struggling to understand if his nightlight program during one of the Ardu block tasks was working as he had intended. And he asked one of the instructors to check his code and ask him if he had done it right. 
So the instructor, instead of telling him yes or no, asked him to talk through, uh, to see if, to talk through his code to see if he could answer the question on his own. And as he talked through the program, uh, he pointed the cube up towards the light and down towards the table and commented, so now if you point it this way, uh, it's lighting up so it makes sense. So in this way, he was able to test and refine his understanding of the code. Um, under engagement, we found that there was a um, relationship, uh, there, uh, there was a relationship between difficulty, enjoyment, and engagement. Um, so actually, uh, more challenging tasks at, uh, fostered sustained engagement and enjoyment, but only when they were kind of appropriately scaffolded. Um, the second finding related to how self-paced structure enabled the students to self-regulate their attention. Um, so specifically, the students were able to go at their own pace, stop when they were feeling overwhelmed, and join in with the others uh, when they were ready to start the tasks again. So I think the key takeaway um, of this research is really that we've shown kind of a way of supporting inclusive computing by using a physical toolkit and a number of strategies for designing learning tasks based on past uh, special education needs and universal design for learning uh, literature. Um, so our intervention tried to address uh, some key challenges in special education needs classrooms, including difficulty with understanding and recalling abstract concepts, difficulty with sustaining attention, and difficulty with collaboration. And uh, we've shown that inclusive computing can be promoted by enabling students to collaborate by showing and sharing a physical interface, discovering computational concepts through enactment and embodied actions, coding and debugging understanding through physical actions, and allowing students to go at their own pace by allowing self-regulated tasks. Uh, thank you. Questions? Hi, great talk. Um, Vivian Marci from George Mason University. I was wondering about the training session, like how did you go um, for them to learn how to use the toolkit and if any adaptation was needed in the programming environment? Um, so the, we didn't have any kind of specific training sessions before the intervention. So I think like the, the sessions themselves kind of acted as the training sessions. Um, and we definitely uh, kind of adapted the learning activities a bit from what we used with other uh, types of learners. And this was using the, the strategies I discussed um, previously. Um, so uh, making the tasks shorter and more attainable and kind of enabling, um, yeah, enabling students to go at their own pace. And we did this by, um, by discussing all the sessions prior to the sessions themselves with the teacher and kind of getting their, his guidance on uh, how, how they could best be structured. One more question. Hi, uh, this is a really great work. Thank you. And I have a um, like method um, question. And you had a peer-to-peer -peer inter interview study. And I was wondering like, what made you decide to peer-to-peer -peer interviews? And what did you find from the peer-to-peer -peer interview? Was it really um, helpful to, for you to um, analyze data or get some findings? Um, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we, we really wanted to, for the peer interviews, um, it was based on a previous study. Um, I, it's, it's, the citation is in the paper. I completely forgot to cite the previous study, I'm sorry. But um, the, yeah, the peer interviews we used as a method of um, getting the students to, um, to uh, yeah, kind of reflect with each other because uh, we wanted to get more of their input and we did find some interesting findings we did find a kind of breakdown in comprehension in one particular student who was uh, kind of on the more severe end of the autism spectrum who we actually thought had understood a lot more of the concepts uh, than he did so he was he was kind of unable to show that he understood the concepts through the peer interviews so there is a lot more detail on it in the paper um, but yeah I think that's a great question thank you let's thank our